right, thank you for tuning in to Friends Talking Nerdy. This is the sexiest voice in podcasting today. The second time is the charm, Tim Jowsma. And joining us this week is the greatest legal mind in the Pacific Northwest. We have Professor Aubrey. How are you doing? I am very good, Tim. It's good to see you. Yeah, I know. We rarely, rarely see each other. I know. I, know, I right? hardly ever run into you. I know. Um, this week, the Reverend Tracy has, has not been able to... Um, uh, join us uh, just with the holidays, with with everything going on in life. I mean, you know, every sometimes you need uh, time to just kick back and breathe. And right now, that's it. I, I know one big thing is that her husband uh, wrapped up a big final for school, whatever he's studying. You know, I think he's going to be a beautician. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, he, you know, hopefully that went well. But uh, she's taking a break this week, um, and in two weeks she will also be taking. Uh, break as well but uh of course we got professor aubrey here now um if you've been tuning Big shout out to um reverend tracy um hope, mm-hmm. hope she enjoys the episode this week i hope so it'll be a little different on the other side of the mic i know yeah you don't have it's not a listener i guess but uh yeah this week um on the facebook page i made the announcement that Oh, the big announcement. The big announcement, yeah. And that big announcement is going to have to wait because you are nerding out this week about something. Tell folks what that is. I'm totally nerding out this week about knitting. Yeah, knitting. Tell everybody about it. knitting. So um, I learned to knit probably 20, at least 20 years ago. And um, I've been, I've learned from my mother and I've been... Knitting, um, not a lot, I'd say for the last 10 years, I haven't really knit anything. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to knit um, gifts for people this holiday season. And so I've been working on those gifts and it's been really fun. And I've remembered how awesome it is to knit. Knitting is super easy and it's really relatively cheap in terms of a new craft. You get yourself a, a... a set of circular needles and some nice yarn and you can make a hat and a scarf and um i just want to remind people like i needed to be reminded hey knitting is cool and awesome i don't see as many people out there knitting as as there were maybe a decade ago um and to say it's okay if you have lots and lots of crafty hobbies and you put them down and pick them back up at random because that's what I do all the time. Um, so I might be sewing something one week, and then six months later I'm knitting, and six months later I'm doing... Um, the other thing I was really into was uh, needle felting wool. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a while, and now I can always go back to that. It's like once you learn a craft, you can always go back to that craft. Yeah, that's the great thing about dating you, the fact that if we got lost in the woods somewhere, you know, I mean, you'd be able to build us a cabin, you'd be able to make us clothes, you'd be able to cut down a tree and build a fire, and then I'd be at the homestead like, oh, you. <laughs> oh, tell me more about my eyes. Tell me more about my eyes. Yeah, I mean, I do feel like throughout my life I've learned, um, you know, how to how to do things. Like, it's always been something for me to like see something and say I want to do that and then just figure out how to do it and learn how to do it I don't think there's really anything I couldn't learn how to do me sometimes I feel like there's a character in Family Guy who like works at a convenience store and whatnot, and he's like a comic book nerd and like you ever see the movie Krull and the naked part and you know 20 minutes and 30 seconds at this part but at one point he talked about you know like he was talking to Chris and was like one time I got this application for a dirt bike race and I almost filled it out. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like that guy. You know? That you've had lots of like sparks of interest in things, but you've never followed through with any of them. Most of them. I mean, obviously, one you know interest right now is 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 definitely one of those interests, and I am a much better person. A period for, uh, for it. I mean, the sh- you know the show it's it has had so much happen. it's caused so much to happen in my life it's uh, definitely interesting but uh um anyway yeah i know with um when i was a kid my grandmother and, and i'm sure she's i believe she still does because i know in storage we got that box of my grandmother's uh, uh knitting stuff but my grandma for forever um she always had to have some art 
things somewhere. I mean, my, um, you know, my grandma, like any family member, has, has her faults, like anybody. So, and I'm not here to talk about her faults, but one of her big positives, one thing I've always tried to emulate is the fact that she's always had something creative to do. And I, I like that attitude because, you know, some people, when they do something creative, whether it's something like knitting or a podcast or whatever, have big grandiose dreams and then get upset that, you know, those dreams weren't all fulfilled without realizing the fact that the joy is not achieving wealth and fame and all that stuff. It's about the satisfaction you get from, I mean, I, I saw the look on your face when you completed that hat. You, you were nervous about it, but, you know, look at all the attention you got on Facebook when I had you put that picture up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so maybe this, you know, I just think it's so important, and we've talked about this recently, too, this just idea that, you know, spend time doing the things that make you really happy, um, whatever that is, and... And create those opportunities if, because especially with the pandemic, it's being tough to get out. Um, you know, because one thing we can announce uh, right now, um, it, we don't want to go too much into detail, but we have a book club finally coming. Yay, the book club! Yeah, so we're going to be recording uh, that next week and then putting it out shortly thereafter. So um, hopefully, you know, that's something that, you know, you and I uh, ended up uh, doing so we, so we didn't have to, you know, play Jeopardy over and over <laughs> every single day and then you hear me complain about Jeopardy being rigged or something like that. But, right, and you just lose all the time and so you don't enjoy that. You don't like losing. Yeah, because it's the damn controller. I try to click in, but no, your controller, you're just sitting close. Anyway, game developers just have it out for me. Yeah, yeah. all of them. Yeah. But you got one hat down. Um, you are working on another hat right now. Is it going to be all yes. hats for the season? It is going to be all hats for the season. Um, that it just took my fancy to make hats this year. I don't know how many I will get done. I'm really hoping that I'm going to get four done before um, the holidays. But we will see if I'm that uh, that good. If I'm that fast. Well, I mean, you got the time. <laughs> you know? Hopefully. I mean, working from home and all that yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so that is what I've been nerding out about. What have you been nerding out about? Me, Hollywood has been an interesting place the past couple of weeks, and we've had some major news hit that I think people don't even realize yet just how major it is, uh, with Warner Brothers announcing that 17 of their films that are currently in development, films like The Matrix Part Four, The Suicide Squad, Dune, High big budget movies are going to appear in theaters and on HBO Max the same day they are in theaters when they debut. And with no it's not going to be like Disney Plus with Mulan where you got to pay a little bit extra. The the money you pay for HBO Max is going to get you uh, like d December 25th. I'm anxiously awaiting watching Wonder Woman 1984. You know, I mean that's going to be awesome to uh, see and whatnot, but the big thing by doing that is that this uh, the, the the theater movie theater going industry was already in decline. The pandemic, um, I've mentioned on the show many times before, but the pandemic has really kicked uh, kicked the industry in the gut. And with this news, regardless of whether it turns out being a success for Warner Brothers or not, I think um, if people get a taste for high quality entertainment at a particular price without the hassle that you get going to movie theaters, people are going to take that over over you know over trying to deal with what what you deal with in a corporate run movie theater. Um, what have, what have uh, we've talked about this you know off and on since the news hit? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's interesting that one of the big ones, Wonder Woman 1984, is going to be coming out on Christmas Day, which is one of the huge movie going days of the year. And it's like people are home, and you want to get out of the house. And what is there to do to get you out of the house? You've been in the house for you know three or four days by that point, getting ready for the holiday spending time with your family, and then you just kind of want to bail and go to the movies. At least that's been my experience of Christmas Day movies. Um, so it's a little bit different experience, but, you know, maybe you go to a friend's house and watch it. Or, you know, it still can be an event um, without going to the movie theater and having all the costs that's associated with that, plus 
the whole pandemic issue, are people actually going to be going to the movies on Christmas Day this year? I that, hope not. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, we're already seeing um, seeing the tragic signs of not listening to doctors' advice uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday. I mean, the numbers of people getting infected and the people dying um, have increased dramatically. So, no, I don't think people are going to the movie theaters anytime soon. And from all accounts, it looks like. By the time the, the 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 vaccine that they're working on reaches us, it's going to be April, May. Even then, it's, you know, just because you take it doesn't mean everything is all better still. And it may be only good for three months. It may be a vac- vaccine that you have to take every three months. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think like lots of things with the pandemic, it's like, we get to a new normal. Like I think more people will be working from home in the future. And um, so it's just yet another thing that's sort of changing culturally as a result of this public health crisis. Yeah. And I, I, for me, it's, it's bittersweet because on the one hand, you know, there are some theaters that I have no problem with the experience. Um, Like the Laurelhurst is a great theater in town. Um, The Hollywood theater have nothing but great things to say about all my experiences there, but um, other places, not so much. I mean, uncomfortable seating, um, you know, popcorn that was cooked at eight o'clock that morning and just still sitting there. Uh, I'm sure it's not that bad, but you know what I mean? Just stale taste tasting popcorn and and just uh, you know having to deal with maria menounos <laughs> maria menounos <laughs> she's like the, the 21st century mary hart i mean i i mean she's a wrestling fan so i'll give her a break but you know um just uh, there are things i would not miss about the movie theater experience but then i think back to you know the first movie i went to et and how that blew my mind i mean uh, or being 13 You know what? Movies are like a safe thing to send a 13-year-old to do, or at least they used to be, right? And those sort of young adults spend a lot of time at the movies, going to movies. Um, And so I think that something will have to replace that. It will. I mean, I think, you know, there are some signs out there of what could be done. Like uh, Kevin Smith uh, has done it with his past few movies. I know Quentin Tarantino, I believe he did it with The Hateful Eight in terms of making it a touring event, like a concert. Uh-huh. Um, they uh, they would have the movie shown at like the Arlene Snitzer um, palette, you know, movie, the, the concert hall in, in town here, um, a, a place like that. They would show the movie and then they would have like, um, like Kevin Smith would usually do like a QA and a um, afterwards and then you can, you know, buy, you know, tchotchkes from him or get an autograph or something like that. They, but actually, make it an hear, event. they actually here in Portland, um, they do do film screenings at the museum, certain films. And so it could be that kind of thing. It could be that too. I mean, at the end of the day, the saddest part for me is this. In Portland, we're going to be fine. I mean, one way or another, we're a big enough city that we are going to have some place dedicated to replicating the old movie theater experience. What I'm worried about is somebody in small town Michigan, in small town Minnesota, small town Iowa, small town anywhere that's miles away from from the big city. They're not going to have that experience anymore. Now, having said that, you know, if they don't get a chance to experience that, they're not missing out. So it's not the end of the world. And at the end of the day, we're just talking about a form of entertainment. And, you know, forms of entertainment have come and gone and everything will adjust. You know, if anything, this is just a big example of how short we really, how short, you know, our society really is, if, if that makes sense, in terms of everything we take for granted today hasn't really been around for that long. I mean, the movies are just a little over a hundred years old, and mm. you know that that's pretty that's that's a pretty good run for a, a form of entertainment. But things you know can and will adjust, and and they always will. Yeah, it just happens faster now because technology is available to make it so you can watch. And glorious, I remember my my mother came to visit Portland one time, and she was we were talking about what we we're going to go do next. We were like, should we go to the mansion? Should we go to the park? Should we go to the, what should we do? My sister and I and um, went back to talk to my mother who was sitting in the guest bedroom and she was sitting on the bed watching um, Inglorious Bastards on her iPod mini. Ooh. Right? But she was like holding it right in front of her eyeballs watching it and she was like so happy that she could like 
watch her movie wherever she wanted to with that technology that was available, right? Mm -hmm. And the technology just keeps getting better and better and better. But, like, I was watching movies on my phone before that was, you know, super high quality. And that, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is going to be that. I, I think for me, though, it's it's a shared, the, the shared experience about being in a room with people. But, you know, again, you know, like I said, if, if uh, film companies, uh, you know, like have, uh, like John Williams in the past has, you know, like for the E.T. 20th anniversary in Los Angeles at the Hollywood Bowl, he played live with a symphony orchestra the music to E.T. as it was playing. And then on the E.T. 20th anniversary DVD, um, that was like a bonus track that, that you could listen to the soundtrack being played. But that was a special event where everybody congregated to watch the movie. There will still be events like that. I don't, I mean, movies are not going to die. I mean, and that kind of segues into what I wanted to, what, you know, and, and to the other part of the topic is the Disney investor call uh, was today on the 10th as we record this and it brought us some really interesting news about future content boy it did didn't it it did um tons and tons of star wars news it's been confirmed that uh for the star wars obi-wan television show hayden christensen is going to be back as anakin skywalker this is going to be set 10 years after revenge of the sith so anakin is Darth, Darth Vader. Vader. That's going to be awesome. Um, you know, they announced uh, Star Wars Ahsoka TV show, which makes sense. You don't get Rosario, you don't cast Rosario Dawson for one episode of one TV show. You cast her to, you know, be that character. Yeah, yeah. So she's um, going to take that. And, and what I forgot to, uh, to mention on social media too is that this, along with another show, I forgot the name of it off the top of my head, but they're going to kind of do like a an Avengers type of deal. They're going to have a couple of TV shows culminating into one big, massive end game type of TV um, Star Wars TV show, uh, where the whole world gets to blow up and do whatever. You know? <laughs> so that's going to be fun. Um, they announced uh, a the next Star Wars movie that will hit theaters is going to be Star Wars Rogue Squadron, directed by one Patty Jenkins, who directed uh, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman 1984. She directed the movie Monster, which um, I, I really, really loved. The Eileen Morris movie? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that movie was fucking amazing. And, and it's just, I, I, I find it just sick that someone who could make a movie that won an Oscar such a good movie ended up being unemployed virtually for 10 years before wonder woman came along but you know you know that's sexism in hollywood for you but anyway she's finally getting her due um you know fortunately you know so there's that and marvel announced some interesting news what did you find most interesting that marvel said oh there really wasn't a, a big surprise. Honestly, I was waiting for them to say something about Spider-Man, but it makes sense that they did not because technically um, Spider-Man is Sony's film, so mm. I'm sure Sony wouldn't want that. But um, just if anything, I'm just overall excited for the entire Marvel content just because it seems like they're going into some unique directions that can open things up for a wide variety of storytelling uh, options. Like Spider-Man 3, it is um, been confirmed that a number of actors who worked on previous different versions of Spider-Man films are coming to this Spider-Man film as the characters they played. So Alfred uh, Molina, who played Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2, is coming back as Doc Ock. Um, Jamie Foxx, who was Electro in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, He's going to be Electro again. So it's, there's there's a lot in, in of unique stuff in store. There's even um, rumors that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are going to be back as Spider-Man as well. Whoa. So it's going to be like a big multiverse type of deal. But um, definitely, definitely exciting news from there. And, and it, it, it's interesting that they're going this route too because they are using Disney Plus as a way to kind of feed into the movie. So the WandaVision show is going to be the first big thing coming out on January 15th. That is going to tie into uh, the Doctor Strange movie that comes out. And then the Doctor Strange movie will tie into Spider-Man 3. And then, you know, the other TV shows will kind of intersect with uh, the movies as they go along too. Um, the Loki trailer was fun. 
Yeah, the Loki trailer was fun. Yeah, and I didn't catch it at first, but somebody uh, did a screenshot. Apparently, Loki is going to be D.B. Cooper. <laughs> Mysterious uh, guy who robbed like a million bucks uh, and jumped out of a plane in the Pacific Northwest here and um, was never caught. But he's going to be Loki in the movie? Uh, it's, well, it's just he was on a plane and he looked like D.B. Cooper. So people are oh. making the assumption that he is. I don't think it was necessarily confirmed or anything like that. But um, it's interesting, though, that they are taking the long form storytelling that television has to offer and tying that into the movies. If, if I mean, as far as I can remember, this is probably the first time that this has been attempted on, on, on this measure. And hopefully, I mean, it's Marvel. They, they've shown they can pull off the impossible so far. So, I mean, they will make it work. But, you know, I, I, it's like, how could they? It's going to be interesting to see how they can do this long term um, to not make it to where people get resentful that they have to essentially pay money to see the payoff for something that was initiated in the Disney Plus show. Right, well, yeah. But that's, I mean, that's typical of any TV show that has a movie associated with it, which many shows do. Uh, yes and no. It, it's it's the the characters that are going to be in this in these TV shows um, will also be in the movies as well. So it's just it's unique that you have this kind of blending between between the two. So and that's a different story for a different day. I'm just really really excited for what what Marvel has to offer. And um, they did announce that uh, the director of the Spider Man Homecoming, uh, John, um, oh I forgot his last name, but um. John, fuck it. Um, he he is the director of the Spider Man uh, Marvel uh, Spider Man movies. Is going to direct the Fantastic Four. Right. I thought you'd be excited about that. Yeah. Um, and then I thought the news about that they're not replacing Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. Chadwick Boseman as in... T'Challa, Black Panther. Exactly. Yeah. Um... Because we didn't know that for sure. There was lots of speculation about whether they would or whether they wouldn't. And it and it makes sense. I mean, I I, I think yeah, it probably would it, it would could they have pulled it off? Sure, but I think it would have been tacky to recast this quickly, right? You know, and I I, I think with since you're talking about a comic book story and, and and a comic book universe that has multiverses where different versions of the same character exist, somewhere down the line, I I I would be shocked if they didn't have a new T'Challa, but. That's going to be years down the road, at, you know, long after the shock of, you know, what happened a couple of months ago, um, you know, has, has worn off. And I think that will be the best way to honor his memory as well on letting that character live on. Yeah. So, but anyway, let's talk about what people really wanted to hear this week. The Facebook announcement. I finally Tim watched, watched the, Princess the Princess Bride. Bride. Yes. Um, how did you like it, Tim? Before we get into that, oh, okay, yeah, we're gonna tell a little story here now. The thing about this whole ordeal is that in, in, ordeal, this whole situation okay. is uh, ordeal is not. It's not a negative. It's not leave me hiccuping again. My God, um, I make you nervous. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um. I am not a fan of fantasy movies, so the, primarily my decision over the years of not watching The Princess Bride has not been because Andre made me cry. It's just that I had no interest in watching that movie. The Andre story, the reason I told people that is that I liked the reaction people would give when I would say Andre the Giant made me cry when I was 11 so I'm not going to watch that movie out of spite and people uh, would just get so defensive and, and like but you gotta watch it it just I, I just I, it's a beloved movie okay it's beloved by many people that's good <laughs> you know but um more than anything, uh, the, I, I've been talking about this since like the beginning of the year, since pretty much you know when we first started uh, first started uh, going out and everything. And um, you know, for me, I wanted to make this into an event to kind of, in my way, honor 
what Andre the Giant did as a wrestler because whether you like wrestling or not, you cannot deny the artistry that goes goes into it. Like take someone like Orange Cassidy, for instance. When he is on TV playing that character, he truly believes everything he does. Um, would someone act like he does in real life? No, it's a show he's putting on. But because he is living that character, he's able to give it life, give it nuance that um, it, you know it, that that just comes directly from the performer himself. And you know that's what I've always loved about professional wrestling: the fact that you got these um, you know supreme athletes that are also tra- you know trained in manipulating emotions being able to get a rise out of people so yeah i mean i do think back a lot on the hogan versus andre match on on the main event and yes i did cry when it happened i cried like a little bitch um but i think back on that memory with a big smile on my face because to me that is the beauty of professional wrestling right there having a twin referee come out and having your having it's a twin oh my god and you find out that your opponent paid for this twin referee and they they um you know beat up the other referee in the back and whatnot and then you get so emotionally invested and 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 it draws you in and that's the beauty of what uh you know for me professional wrestling is so being able to do something like what we did with the show here was in my way a way to kind of do what they do in a sense in terms of living a character of the bitter guy that was mad that Andre made him cry um while while you know just if anything I I would hope people have gotten that that have paid attention to this have gotten more of an appreciation for Andre than anything because the more people you know try to defend that movie and try to defend Andre the more they learn about him and the more they learn about him the more they care for him you know what I mean yeah well, so it was all a uh, put on. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you make it sound so negative, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like a Jim Baker, Tammy Faye Baker type of put on. Or anything <laughs> like that. No one was harmed in the put on. No, right? You didn't, you know. And and I made it clear too. I mean, because I wanted a particular story to be told. Um, the story is. Don't hold grudges. And, you know, my sister mentioned on the show before that I do hold a grudge a uh-huh. lot. And, and I can hold a grudge like nobody's business. And, you know, in some cases that's earned. In some cases, though, you just got to let things go. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to associate with that person again if it's something negative or whatever. But, you know, it's just some things you, you can't let a grudge rule your life. And, you know, that's the kind of the story I, I was uh, looking looking to tell with this in terms oh, of well, just, good. yeah. Yeah, because that was my big thing with it as well was um, I just didn't want you to get away with avoiding something for all of your life that was good. And, I mean, I think, you know, we could talk about the movie, but the movie is a cultural icon. And, you know, and as somebody who follows Hollywood and, and pop culture – you were missing a bunch of jokes for a long, or, you know, missing a bunch of references for a long time because you hadn't seen that movie. Do you feel enriched in any way? No, you just really Mm -hmm. didn't like it. No, I, I, that's the secret here, folks. And I knew it was going to happen after, after all this, I watched that movie and I didn't like a minute of that film. I hated it. Oh my god. Having said that, having said that, I want to make it clear to all the uh, Princess Bride fans that are now brandishing weapons, sharpening them up, you know, making sure the ammo is full. Um, Like like I say constantly with the music reviews, I fully understand that just because I don't like something, that doesn't make it bad. I'm not saying it's bad. Just for my taste, I I knew going in it was not going to be a film I was going to like, and it, it... didn't disappoint. <laughs> you know? Well, I must say you watched it very respectfully to have to to be like, oh my god, it was so awful. You you well, didn't give that away at all. Well, that's the thing too. I mean, we are talking Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner, his you know filmography speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before this, uh, you know, this is Spinal Tap. After, I mean, he did Misery for God's sake. You know, um, so I there wasn't. It's it's not that the film didn't have any value for me. I think the funniest scene 
was when uh, the in- Inigo, whatever. Inigo Montoya? Yeah, when he first encounters the guy with the six fingers and says the catchphrase he's been dying to say, Christopher Guest just stands there for a beat and then just turns and runs at top speed. That almost got a <laughs> laugh out of me. Just like that, right? If anything, I can almost, I can almost guess that that was probably improvised. But if it was improvised, it was the right call because mm-hmm. just having him run away like he did, it was just like he was fucking scared. Yeah, you know. But Christopher Guest, I mean, his, his you know ability as as an overall artist not just an actor you know speaks for itself many times over Mm -hmm. um but carrie elways has always bothered me you know he's he's one of those people that keeps getting work just because of how he looks he has no personality whatsoever you know when uh, you know if you if if i gave his performance from that movie people wouldn't like it but when you look like he does at that age in hell if he did it now you know if he gives that performance you're going to get a lot of ladies like oh well and the thing is too that movie was so popular and was such a sort of important film for so many people he could have been a huge star if he actually had been talented he would have been a big star but he wasn't talented and so he never really became a big star yeah i think the only thing i ever remember remember him from was hot shots yeah that and and i don't even the, uh, those type of films the zucker brothers you know airplane naked gun films there's it, it's great when you see it the first time every single time after that though it just gets worse and worse for me um but yeah overall wasn't it wasn't the movie for me um yeah let let, let's just let's just put it at that i mean the music i think is the most atrocious thing it sounded like a a music that was used in like uh late 80s episodes of doctor who from the bbc just over dramatic uh synthesizer that that's made to sound like an orchestra Uh uh-huh just uh, you know (laughs) you know i i uh, you know if I had more thumbs, I'd, I'd give it as many thumbs down as I could. <laughs> well, you this. know, it was not my favorite movie. It's a very nostalgic movie for me. Like, it, it harkens to a particular time in my life and reminds me of those people and those places and stuff that I did. And, and so, it's good. Um, and... It's always a fun watch for me. Okay. And, and, and that, you know, that's the beauty of movies. And, you know, that, that, that you can... I, I mean, there are like songs that that if I hear them, I, I can like I can almost smell where I was at when I first heard them. You know, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of what art can do in, in terms of bringing you back in time and whatnot. But um, the ordeal for the year is over. Yay! We should plan soon on our next big special event i'm thinking i would love to do another uh battle for state supremacy the battle for state supremacy too you know you would lose that you know where i'm (laughs) from right you know where i'm from it's gonna be tough i mean i think these are two two iconic states so i'm from tennessee and timmy here is from uh, michigan Mm -hmm. and um they're two iconic music states i'm already one and oh Want to know? I know, but that was versus Oregon, which does not have Oregon's got a great music scene, but mostly from imported people. Yeah, and and the only rules that we had for the Battle for State Supremacy is that it had to be an artist that was born in that state, not necessarily a band or a musician you would necessarily associate with that state. So what I mean by that is like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the lead singer Anthony Kiedis is from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I could have used a Red Hot Chili Pepper song. Uh-huh. Um, ultimately, didn't didn't have to. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, that would have been a perfect mm-hmm. example. So if there was... A... I mean, I got Tina Turner. I got Dolly Parton. She's okay. I got... Um, do I have Elvis? No, was I think he was born, he was in, born in like Mississippi, yeah. Uh, I got some good people. I got fucking Motown, baby. Eminem. No, wait, Eminem wasn't born in Michigan, I believe. Oh, maybe. really? He wasn't? I think he may have been born in Indiana or something. Mm. But anyway, um, but yeah, well, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about it. I, I love the idea of quarterly events like this. 
and just, you know, doing something silly and fun and, you know, getting a pie in the face. That was, I've always wanted to have a pie in my face. And you got one. I got one. First time ever. <laughs> you know? I mean, come on. When you grow up watching Three Stooges on, on TV every week, you know, you're going to want at least one pie in your face. And boy, did that sound dirty. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to move on to our music focus of the week. And this week is Remembering a Legend. Um, December 8th, 1980 was a tragic day in the world of popular music because that was the day that John Lennon was murdered. Yeah. Um, what are your first memories of the Beatles or John Lennon? Well, my parents really liked the Beatles. Um, so much so that they had two greatest hits albums. So they had like the greatest hits from... The Blue and the, blue and the Red. The Blue and the Red, which maybe lots of people have those. Those are classics, yeah. Um, and one is from the early 60s, I think. And one is from the later 60s. The, early yeah, the 70s. first one goes from like Love Me Do up until like the singles that came out for Revolver. Um, and then the, the red one is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on to Abbey Road. Yeah. Um, so those are the songs I know most well um, because they're on those albums that I listened to over and over and over again as a child and when I say as a child I mean you know I say five six seven eight on up through um, high school child so I've always really loved the Beatles um, but I never well you know we were never alive at a time when the Beatles didn't exist so we, I think we missed out on a huge part of the sort of cultural the, the icon formation of the Beatles right like they were just always available in the background I knew about them I enjoyed the music um, I think I recognized it for the important music that it was yeah and um, yeah I've just always loved them yeah the first time I kind of remember them was in like 87 88 Nike had an ad uh, that had revolution. Uh, playing and I remember uh, talking about it with my mother on the phone because she had uh, sent me off to a friend of her friend of hers house in Lowell, Michigan, uh, to hang out with like this guy's son or whatever. But the son and I just had no chemistry whatsoever. He was like a he, he, Lowell is like a, a country compared to Grand Rapids, so you know he wanted to go dirt bike racing and all that, and me I just wanted to watch TV. Uh -huh. So I wasn't fun to hang around for him at all. No, but um, I do remember that remember that conversation with her. And um, but for me, the Beatles didn't uh, really become important until I was sixteen. I, oh wow! Yeah, I had run away from home. You know, te technically, because I, you know, was upset at my mother. Um, you know, if you think I'm an emotional little bitch now, um, you should have seen me at 16. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I hear, I hear you, brother. I mean, I was ridiculous as a teenager. And yeah, so. I and mean, my sister's like laughing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah. I used to like listen to Smiths. I had a Walkman, and I used to listen to the Smiths and walk around in cemeteries smoking cigarettes when I was 16, dressed all in black. <laughs> Oh man, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I would not have been caught dead with a cigarette because my mother would have killed me. Even though she's like one of those do as I say, not as I do types. You know, uh -huh. she, she would have like spanked me while smoking a cigarette. Oh wow! Don't smoke a cigarette. You know, type of deal. <laughs> um, just uh, yeah, I had gone upset over her or something, and then I, I I did run away from home, but I went and stayed with my dad. Uh, essentially which was its own little trip but um you know during that time when i was hit them with him i skipped school a lot and being 16 and six foot five you're not getting hassled if you're out and about in town um so one time i was uh just happening by and walked by a pawn shop went in checked out their music selection with their cassettes they were selling it for a dollar saw sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band and thought yeah i remember them my mother liked them i'll buy that so Bought the album, went home, put it on, and my God, what an album. I mean, it, it's it's like everything is what I expected it to sound like for the Beatles up until A Day in the Life. 
mm. a day in a life hits and that just floored me i mean my jaw was like that gif i like to use of uh, brian griffin from family guy where his jaw literally hits the table uh-huh. that was me when i when when i first heard that song and just um from there i had to if i get interested in something i get kind of obsessive with it so at that point um you know i you know still when i had a library card went to the library and you know like checked out all their records on lp and then on my dad's uh, 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 record player you know transferred them to cassette and you know which okay. was actually much better than listening to them digitally now um because beatles on lp have have a much more richer bass sound than than digital has ever been able to capture uh in my opinion but um but yeah just listening to their work and then afterwards started uh getting into uh lennon you know since we're talking about john lennon here some of his solo work but lennon's solo work was kind of erratic i mean he ha- obviously had moments of brilliance you know look at imagine um which you know is on the playlist that uh, we looked at this week and i mean that's a song that i can i i would be absolutely shocked that they're not talking about that song 500 years from now i mean that's like beethoven's fifth i mean it's it's that's that high quality type of song whether you like that song or not you have to acknowledge its impact that song is going to stay i couldn't agree with you more about that song i mean i think that's probably the the song that will last the longest of of john lennon's work um it is just such a beautiful song with such a profound message that people will be interested in forever if only they would act on it <laughs> which you know and, and a lot of that too <laughs> we're, we have another sh- sherman get down from there <laughs> we had steaks tonight for dinner so um sherman likes to uh go in the kitchen and, and hop on the sink uh luckily we we're able to cover it earlier <laughs> but, yeah anyway uh, what was i saying <laughs> you were saying we were talking about imagine and i said i thought it would last a long time too and you said you thought it would last 500 years like beethoven's fifth symphony yeah and it's you know it's just he has so many uh, i mean because i thought about it and like take a look at his compatriot paul mccartney paul mccartney is great at doing love songs yeah but you ask him to do a heavy rocker maybe he can pull out a helter skelter but that's not really his interest and it's kind of like kevin smith you know it's like he was it like mccartney found his niche and has milked the hell out of it and good for him because he's made a lot of money but john lennon was able to create so much different sounding stuff you know i mean because i you know one of the ones on the playlist here i am the walrus Mm mm-hmm like a year and a half before that he was singing help ticket to ride you know i mean think how how i mean it would be like the backstreet boys coming out with like a you know celtic monk track on one of their albums or something just something bizarre not a left field that you did not expect from a popular band like that yeah i mean the the different periods they performed and wrote music uh, is amazing given the amount of time it, it feels like they were around for a lot longer than they actually were mm-hmm. because the they were so prolific and there was such diversity in the work yeah now what would you say for the Beatles what would you say is your favorite album um the white album uh, I, I think most people would say that. Yeah. It's just a really great album. Agreed. From start to finish. Yeah. Um, for the playlist uh, I chose this week, um, like half the songs are from the White Album. <laughs> but he did so much good stuff on there, like uh, Dear Prudence. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love that song. Um, Prudence is actually about Prudence Pharaoh, Mia Pharaoh's sister. Because um, this song was written um, uh, uh, about an event that happened uh, when they were uh, in India at the Maharishis. So, and I guess Prudence was trying to be an extremely devoted follower. And Lenin was just like, come out, smell the nice summer air, you know, d- enjoy life. It's great that you want spiritual enlightenment, but you got to have physical enlightenment as well. And you're not going to get that hiding in a building reading books, you know. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, 
Now, do you have any, besides Imagine, any favorites from his solo work? <coughs> Probably Love. Why is that? Uh, it's just, that's just a beautiful song. It's so sparse and... Um, Bowie has a song that I really like called Letter Letter to Hermione, which is not a lot of, it's not a super crazy popular song. And I feel that way about love as well. Like, it's not a crazy popular John Lennon song, but it's really beautiful. And it really sounds different from other stuff that he was doing. Yeah. Um, that has to be one of my favorites as well, because that song kind of encapsulates that feeling you get when you've laid yourself raw and open and naked to somebody and they totally accept you mm. you know to me it's like it, it's capturing that level of love it's not the superficial hey you're cute uh, you, I think you're cute too our genitals are so happy yay type of deal yay. It, it's it's a lot more a lot more than that and you know coming off the album it came from too um, that was the Plastic Ono Band album Mm -hmm. um, you know, he dealt with a lot of dark, dark stuff on there. Like Cold Turkey was about, uh, you know, going cold turkey off of heroin. And at the end, he's literally screaming in anguish. Um, you got Mother, a uh, song about his mother um, and, and father and how they were not the best of parents, which again ends with him screaming. So the fact that it came to this, um, you know, if anything, it probably was another one of those love letters to, to Yoko that, that he wrote. I mean, a lot of his songs were love letters to them to her and um you know while they definitely had a rocky marriage you know you can't doubt the fact that you know they both truly really did love each other yeah totally yeah <laughs> totally it was a great romance between john and yoko right yeah unique one but yeah and i was watching a little uh uh interview that he did with dick cavett on on youtube and i don't even know why it was because like, like dick cavett i i I, why was he ever a thing? <laughs> he really was, though, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, I mean... He I was a very big television interviewer in that era. I mean, I did do some research on him today and found out that, like, he got his start as, like, a comedy writer for Jack Parr. Mm. Um, did have, you know, did have... Um, one funny line that I guess is attributed to him that Jack Parr would do when Jane Mansfield came on the show. And Jane Mansfield, you're familiar with her? Yes. Uh, the line that Jack Parr would say is, there they are, Jane Mansfield. <laughs> 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 so that was funny. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, overall, you know, go ahead. So I think, you know, to the relationship between John and Yoko as always to me, because I people get... I always seem to be people were upset with him for being with her, right? This idea that he was so great and she was so not great. She wasn't attractive. People couldn't understand what she was saying. She wasn't an artist that was appreciated. Um, like, she was just really not well-liked at all. And... So what their relationship has always made me think of is just how you never know what a relationship is like on the inside. Like, you can't judge a relationship just based on, oh, I know Sally and I know Bob, so I understand what their relationship must be like. Mm -hmm. Because once you get the chemistry of those two, two, two or three or four, or however many people together, um, something different is happening uh, in terms of the chemistry, right? So... <sighs> That's just what they always make me think of is just you never know what somebody's relationship is like on the inside. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, sadly enough, I do think a lot of a lot of the reaction was probably Racist. racial. Ra yeah, ra racial too. Uh, I, I shouldn't say probably. It, I mean, I, it, there probably are v very clear examples of people being overtly racist uh, to her. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I... I've always, she's always seemed cool. <laughs> you know? I, I would have loved to have met her at, at least, um, you know. She... I think now, like when I see her work or hear about something she's doing, um, I appreciate it. 
Yeah, like I, I know in '92, uh, Nike again uh, used Instant Karma for uh, um, one of their ads, and you know uh, there was a quote attributed to Yoko, like, you know, they paid me X amount of dollars for this, and all that money went to the United Negro College Fund, and a lot more people got to hear John Lennon's music. What's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, I mean, which is the central gist of a message, and and and, and I I agree with that. You know, I mean, it would. I, I mean, you can always have that argument of, of what, you know, what is the level you should be at in terms of letting your music influence advertising and when you need to pull back, I guess. But that's a different story for a different day. And, you know, it's not like, you know, it's John Lennon for Arby's, you know, right. or anything like that. So Not yet. I mean, you saw what's happening with Prince right now is like kind of like that for me. That's slightly different. Um, Prince, uh, it's, it's as famous and as rich as he was, made the mistake of not having a concrete will, uh, de- you know, indicating what resources were going to go where. So it was kind of a free for all after yeah. that. And I, I think there needed to be some balance because I disagreed with his um, stance on streaming. Uh, the only streaming service when he was alive that he allowed his music on was Tidal. Um, which, if you like title, great, whatever. But you know, at, you know, streaming is the new normal for music, and having your music only on one very small music service, you know. Yeah. Right. Anyway, but back to John Lennon. I mean, he's a legend. He's always going to be a legend. I mean, he's one of the few people that you can put up there with the likes of a Beethoven with the likes of a Cole Porter with the likes of a Frank Sinatra with just those artists that will speak to people going forward yeah I totally um, I totally agree yeah yeah I think the weed's hitting both of us <laughs> <laughs> it's friends talking nerdy on weed oh on weed yeah on weed. Oh, that, we should have had a review on that you uh like we, you saw that <laughs> Half baked for the first time. Oh the other yeah, day. I fell asleep fairly quickly. <laughs> I don't really remember that much of it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I remember the part about the on weed. You, you know. Yeah, that's uh, John Stewart before he became the Daily Show. John Stewart. He was in movies talking about you know. Have you ever seen a twenty dollar bill on weed? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man. Yeah. All right, that is going to wrap it up, I think, for another episode. Sounds great. So we can kick back and smoke some more weed. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy out there and friends and talking nerdy land. Yep. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, remember to download, subscribe, you know, tell your friends and family about the show. Spread the word. If you like what you hear, let people know about it and reach us reach out to us on our social media platforms of choice so thank you again for listening and remember it's such a good feeling to know you're alive it's such a happy feeling you're growing inside and when you wake up ready to say i think i'll make a snappy new day it's such a good feeling a very good feeling the feeling you know that I'll be back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you and you'll have things you'll want to talk about I will too you always make each day such a special day you know how by just your being you only one person in the whole world like you That's you yourself. I'll be back next time. Bye-bye. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.